Hello, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kristen Cooper, and I am a licensed marriage and family therapist and board certified behavior analyst with Stride Autism Centers. And I am joined by another um, VCBA from Stride Autism Centers, as well as a doctor from Blank Children's Hospital. And the three of us are hoping to talk with you tonight uh, about introduction to ABA services. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so this evening, we will be giving an overview on um, autism spectrum disorder diagnosis to help, um, help you understand and align expectations for what that process looks like, as well as an introduction to ABA and the process for ABA treatment. And finally, we're going to share some tools that you can use in the meantime and apply immediately some new ideas for you and your family. Okay. I'm going to pass things off to Dr. Sarah Jaglum. Hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Dr. Sarah Jaglum. I'm a licensed psychologist and board certified behavior analyst. Um, and before we move on, I just want to be able to continue to answer questions. Please put them um, in the Q&A as we come up. Um, as you might be able to tell, um, technologically might have some snafus as we typically expect. Um, but please just feel free at any point to put those in the question and answer chat. Um, so moving into first an overview of autism spectrum disorder and the diagnostic process, um, and I am seeing a question already, this will be available later to watch, this is recorded. Um, so autism spectrum disorder is a lifelong condition characterized by two main um, components. One is deficits or difficulties in social communication. This can include things like um, difficulties with back and forth, either conversation or play, um, difficulty with nonverbal communication. And that includes not just eye contact, but things like facial expressions, gestures, and integrating all of those things together in order to communicate. And finally, things about relationships. So understanding of relationships, as well as um, being able to form and maintain friendships and other types of relationships. The other piece of autism spectrum disorder is restricted and repetitive behaviors or interests. This includes four um, subcategories within that. So one is restricted and repetitive movements. So things that you might overtly observe or see. Um, think that could include things like arm flapping, toe walking, rocking, repetitive clapping, a whole host of different repetitive behaviors. Um, other things that might fall in um, that restricted or repetitive interest category include um, things like intensive interest, so having a very strong attachment or fixation to something. Um, the third are things related to rigidity, insistence on sameness, um, insistence on following routines in a certain way. Um, and finally, sensory concerns, either sensory aversion, so particular aversions or avoidance of loud noises or things like that, as well as interest. So excessive um, seeking out of things like, you know, certain textures or smells, et cetera. Um, so just to overview very briefly the diagnostic process, which again can be very different depending on a um, multitude of factors. Um, here at Blank Children's Hospital, there are two types of providers who perform the diagnostic process. One is psychology, which would include myself and my colleague. And then the other side is developmental pediatrics, which includes developmental behavioral pediatricians and nurse practitioners. The process very likely includes parent interview. On the psychology side of things, we typically conduct the interview 
prior to a full evaluation. So there are two separate appointments for that. Um, it may include an observation of your child at that stage. The diagnostic process also includes things like questionnaires about your child's behavior, their adaptive skills, things that are a struggle for them, as well as things that they have strengths in. Um, it would also include standardized measures. So the gold standard for diagnostic um, testing is called the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, second edition, or the ADOS-2. And that often includes, depending on the child's language level, things like play, um, interaction back and forth, whether that be through question and answer or with um, more of a social routine. There are many different ways that we look at symptoms of autism spectrum disorder within the constructs of this ADOS2 observation. Finally, often we um, conduct a problem solving assessment. So things like cognitive abilities, looking at IQ in order to help guide us in terms of not just symptoms of autism spectrum disorder, but other recommendations that may be helpful for school or for learning some more of those adaptive skills. Um, so a common recommendation to treat symptoms of autism spectrum disorder is applied behavior analysis, which is a highly evidence-based practice that we're very excited to share more with you about and give you some tools and tricks for the trade. So with that, I will turn it back over to you, Kristen. Thank you for your patience with our technology here. Um, it turns out the chat is disabled. So if you have a question, put it in the Q&A section and um, we will make sure that those get answered at the end. All right, I'm gonna talk about applied behavior analysis. Like Dr. Jaglin said, um, CBA is likely to be the recommended treatment for autism, the symptoms, treating the symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. And I like to think of ABA as the science of learning. It's not just for children. It's not just for people on the spectrum. It really is the foundational underpinnings of how we learn new skills, why some things some skills or habits stick and others don't. And we can apply that science to helping the kids that we work with learn language, build their vocabulary, understand social communication, understand social skills. Because it's the science of learning, there's really not a limit on what can be taught using this science and the application. So early intensive behavior intervention is the time frame before a child starts full-time kindergarten or first grade. And within that window, it's likely that up to 40 hours a week of ABA will be recommended. That might feel like a little bit of a jaw dropping figure and I'm gonna come back to that. I first wanna talk about the different types of service models for treatment. Um, services can be provided in home, in centers, or a combination. And there are benefits to all of them. And it really comes down to finding the right fit for your child and your family. So in-home treatment is provided in your home. And some parents hear that and they think, awesome, that is exactly what I'm looking for and exactly what I need. Other parents hear that and they might think, hmm, I don't know if that's for me. I need to find out more. And other parents hear that and they think that's an insurmountable barrier and not something that will work for our family. And none of those responses are right or wrong. It's just good information to notice if you had one of those responses because it will inform what might be the right fit for your family should you need to make that decision down the road. For in-home treatment, um, for either in-home or center-based treatment, services are designed by a board-certified behavior analyst, and they work with a treatment team to work with the child. And so one of the other benefits of in-home treatment is that it's possible to engage 
kind of the natural environment around the child, not just at home, but even in the neighborhood and community and services can impact all of those layers that the child lives in. And um, one thing that I have seen parents struggle with is not having access to the peers that they would love their child to be interacting with and practicing some of the new skills with. Uh, like Dr. Jeglum said, there are some social symptoms that can be related to autism spectrum disorder. And so it's wonderful to learn those skills with adults, but then be able to practice them with kids. That's one of the great things about center-based treatment. It's a full package, friends included. And so there's individual treatment time, but there's also built-in group learning so that kids get to practice those skills with their peers and friends. Regardless of the service model, the thing that I want to stress is that parents are the experts on their kids. And so find a provider and program that really incorporates and values you as the parent in treatment goals and programming and make sure that you get all of your questions answered to find out which service model is the right fit for you and your family. Um, so now I'm going to talk about, I had mentioned up to 40 hours a week of ABA may be recommended, and you may be wondering what that looks like. When it's done well, it looks like fun. Kids learn best when they're having fun. People learn best when they're having fun and engaged. And so so many of our learning targets can be embedded in play in a way that kids don't recognize that there's an ulterior motive of learning. They just think they're playing and having fun. And that's really when treatment is most effective. Um, I had mentioned that uh, board certified behavior analysts, clinicians are the ones that design the programs and so there is more going on behind the scenes than just having fun, um, but oftentimes that's what it looks like and that's how it feels, most importantly, to the child. Um, so it also, we want to replicate what other peers and same age kids are doing. And, you know, if you look at this early intervention age, kids are exploring and learning to be curious about the world around them and playing at the park and, you know, climbing and rolling in the grass and all of those things that are just childhood. And we want to make sure that even though it's 40 hours a week, sometimes of treatment, that it's still including all of those components of play and childhood fun with extra learning built in. And so um, we do offer, whether it's home-based treatment or center-based treatment, um, social play, time outside, all of the things that you want your child to be enjoying as well as working in the treatment targets and goals that we have. School readiness is also listed here. And, you know, even for kids as young as two years old, it's not too soon to start to think about school readiness and some of the skills that are gonna help them be successful when they're in a classroom learning environment. Things like following routines and being able to predict the flow of the day can be really helpful. Transitioning between play activities or non-play activities, um, as well as learning from a group not just one-on-one, -on -one, but being in a group learning situation and navigating social skills with peers. So all of those things are gonna help kids be successful in a classroom learning environment. And we can start to plant those seeds and build those skills, even in some of our youngest learners. Treatment goals are created based on ongoing assessments. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the initial assessment process and parent priorities. And so our developmental assessments will include the 
targets that developmentally are appropriate to work on, but parent priorities are, like I already said, a really important part of the treatment as well. So I'm gonna talk through what it looks like to get started with ABA treatment. And the first step is to select a provider and that will be based on what's available in your area and what is the best fit for your family in terms of the service model, home-based, center-based, or a combination of the two. There'll be some kind of intake call or meeting to determine the appropriate fit for that service model. And that's the opportunity to ask the questions that you have and make sure that it feels like a fit for your family. Once assessment starts, what we wanna be able to do is collect up all the information we can about the child so that we understand their learning history, the things that they really love, their strengths, their challenges, and we do that through parent interview, direct testing, and child observations, sometimes at home, sometimes in a center or other community locations so that we can see how they respond in different environments um, and situations. That information then becomes part of what we call the treatment plan. And the treatment plan is created to outline where we wanna go for the next six months. So it will include the assessment results as well as treatment targets and goals that we will work on during that six month authorization. And it's usually a combination of skill acquisition, behavior reduction, and family treatment guidance goals. And I'll talk through each one of those. For skill acquisition, a lot of times it's different targets that come from the assessments that we do. So it's based on different developmental targets and milestones within all of the different domains of learning. And so it might be language goals, both um, expressive and receptive. Receptive would be following instructions, um, responding to their name being called, um, all the way through, you know, even adaptive programs such as learning to wash their hands and do that routine independently. So um, there's a variety of skill acquisition goals and that generally makes up the bulk of a treatment plan. There may be some behavior reduction goals as well. And if there are maladaptive or challenging behaviors that are impeding or acting as a barrier to the child learning from their environment, what we'll do is analyze that behavior and try to get a sense of either what the child's trying to communicate, like what that behavior is communicating or what purpose it's serving so that we can identify if there might be more appropriate or adaptive means of communication or skills and ways to solve those problems such that that challenging behavior um, isn't as necessary or frequent for that child because they've learned other ways to manage and navigate situations. Um, so that's how we approach behavior reduction and there will be goals um, specific to identifying uh, interventions for that if it's appropriate for the child. Parent and family treatment guidance. This is my favorite part of the treatment plan because Parents, again, are the experts on their kids. And this is the opportunity to think about, okay, six months from now, what would make the biggest positive impact for our family? And that's really the goal. Every six months to be able to look back and reflect on, wow, wow, we did that together and it has made a huge positive difference for our family. So some examples of family treatment guidance goals might be, um, you know, I would really like to, I would really like as a parent to teach my child to brush their teeth independently because right now when I try to do it, it's a power struggle. And so that's how we start and end every day. 
and it's exhausting. So that would be an excellent parent training goal to have within the treatment plan that the behavior analyst and team can help you with. Um, another one might be, I would just love to go out to dinner at a restaurant with my family. And right now I don't because it's unpredictable or challenging. And even a goal like that would be appropriate and really valuable to have as part of the treatment plan. So once the treatment plan is complete, it is submitted for funding approval and authorization from the time you have the intake call to starting services and getting to that point where services are approved, it generally takes about four to six weeks. And that is assuming there's not wait lists for the provider that you chose. Um, and it's one of the more challenging things about being a clinician in this field is that we have treatment that works and we all hear about families who are waiting on a wait list to be diagnosed or waiting on a wait list for treatment. And so what we wanna spend the rest of our time talking about this evening is what you can do while you're waiting and different things that you can think about and try at home tonight. So I'm gonna pass things off to my colleague, Rihanna Singleton. Hi, I am Rihanna and I am a board certified behavior analyst. Um, and I am going to be talking about tips and tricks that you can take and begin doing while you're waiting. Um, but we're gonna do a quick pause and kind of address the Q and A since we have, it looks like, couple of questions. Um, will this be available later? To yes, it will be available later to watch. Um, Yeah, do you want to switch to? Switch to, yeah, so um, we just wanted to kind of answer some of these questions as we get them since we're starting to see more pop up. Um, we can talk a little bit about, um, you know, specific behavior concerns that you have with the caveat that obviously every child is different. And while we're hoping that this is helpful, um, these are still tools that are more, um, you know, broadly based and not necessarily something that um, we can guarantee. Um, with the um, question, there's a question about diagnosed, diagnosed last year by a developmental provider. She would not need to see a psychologist as well um, if they've already gotten the diagnosis. Typically, that's not required. That being said, sometimes insurance does require reevaluation after a period of time for other types of reasons, such as waiver support. So I would encourage you to follow up with your um, primary care provider, just to ensure that your child is getting everything that they need. Um, in terms of success rates with ABA, um, like we mentioned, ABA is a highly evidence-based practice. Um, and in terms of things like success rates, um, it's difficult to say um, in general because it encompasses multiple different treatment packages. Um, so I anticipate given the right levels of supports with applied behavior analysis therapy, that there will be an individual success rate that compared to a child's performance prior to the therapy, they will make gains as long as we're monitoring that, those gains and making necessary adjustments relative to that child's needs. So for example, if we're not seeing change or progress in a therapy, we often make decisions in order to help guide that so that we are getting to a success, um, successful um, presentation of behavior. Um, 
And it sounds like that was um, another question too for success rate. And then um, many another question was regarding speech and occupational therapy. Many kids who have an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis require the ABA in addition to speech and OT. That is a very common combination of therapy approaches. In fact, many um, organizations have all of those services together for that reason. Um, so certainly understanding where your child is at in terms of their receptive or understanding of language as well as their expressive, which is their um, ability to communicate either vocally or through an alternative augmentative communication device um, or other types of um, um, communication modalities. Um, certainly understanding that is really, really important, as well as um, occupational therapy in terms of things like those fine motor skills, how you use your hands, um, and adaptive skills, so ways of taking care of yourself. So um, I think that answers most of most of these questions, please keep them coming. We really do appreciate them. Um, and I will turn it back over. Yes. Okay, so we will be talking about some tips and tricks that you can take to take home and begin to work on while you're waiting. Um, so some of the things I'm gonna go over is prioritizing, catching them being good, saying what you mean and meaning what you say and providing a language rich environment. Um, so for prioritizing, prioritizing kindness towards yourself and that connection with your child. Um, as a BCBA, we always just wanna know kind of what Kristen was talking about with like what changes would make the biggest positive impact on your family. Um, especially thinking, I always typically ask parents like short-term goals and long-term goals, like what would you love to see? Um, what kinds of skills, like she was talking about teeth brushing, it could be um, really anything. I've had a lot of parents who have said, we'd love to go on family walks. We love doing that. It's really hard to have them walk with us. Um, and so that's something that we work on so that they can do family walks or even sitting at the dinner table and having a meal is something we'll work on so that that's something that the family can do together. Um, so those things are something that we will be asking in initial intakes and things. And so just thinking of those things in the meantime um, and just challenging behavior and things that um, do impact your life on a daily basis as we will be asking um, a lot of those things whenever you're coming through and working into intake and starting services. Um, catch them being good is the idea that you're going to give the most attention to the behavior you want to see more of. So this is the simplest terms. It is an idea of positive reinforcement. And so our idea is that if you want a behavior to continue to happen, you have to catch it and either praise it or give that some sort of positive reinforcement for that behavior. So a lot of times as a parent myself too, like if I see something happening, like my kids playing really nicely together, I'll try to like sneak away and be like, oh, that's really great. I don't want to interrupt it, but really you want to go in there and be like, that's so great. I love how you're sharing with your sister. You're playing so nicely because you want to see that behavior increase in the future. So you're going to catch them being good. You're going to point out all of the positive things that they're doing throughout the day. I love how you listened. I loved how you went, put your cup in the sink. I, it was so great of you to put your shoes on. You did such a good job. Um, and then you're going to, as much as possible, give little attention to the challenging behavior, obviously with addressing safety. So blocking from danger, moving items, um, like if kids are jumping off of things or climbing up on things, obviously redirecting from that with as little like verbal attention, maybe redirecting, helping them to put their feet on the floor. Um, if they're throwing things, this example is, I'm going to hold this block, but you can throw a ball. So giving them what they can do which kind of bleeds into my next point as well. Um, but with addressing safety, giving as little attention to those things that you wanna see decrease and as much attention as you can to the things that you wanna see increase. Um, and for that next, this next point is say what you mean and mean what you say. Um, so biggest tip is to tell kids what they should be doing and not what they shouldn't be doing. So instead of, don't jump or no jumping on the couch or no climbing on the table or anything like that, you're going to say feet on floor 
Um, if they are engaging in aggression, you could say, we keep our hands to ourselves or we keep our hands in our lap. Um, so you're going to give them instructions that they can follow and you're going to be setting that expectation for them as far as what you want to see them do versus what you don't want to see them do. Um, and that helps with them knowing what you're expecting of them and what they can do instead, just like with the expectation of, well, we're not gonna throw the block, but what, instead you would say, we can throw the ball, um, giving them that option of what they could do instead. So saying what you mean and meaning what you say. And then this last tip, um, so creating a language rich environment kind of has multiple parts to it. Uh, the biggest thing is setting aside 10 minutes every day to kind of join your child's world. So like putting your phone away, maybe even plugging it in upstairs, sitting down and just narrating what your child is doing. So just talking about what they're doing, uh, no questions, no instructions, just maybe talking about what they're doing. So if they're playing with the cars, you could say, wow, your car's going down so fast. You have the blue car, I have the red car. Just talking and creating a lot of language around what they're doing and just watching how they play. Often times we will imitate how they play. So if they like doing something a certain way, we'll imitate how they're playing. And just kind of taking that 10 minutes to focus on that kiddo with no distractions and to just kind of join their world and to just observe them and to not have any instructions, not have any questions for them and just kind of creating more language around what they're doing so that they hear those words more often and can start pairing them with the things that they do every day. Um, I think that that is when we can go back to kind of our Q and A. There's a few more. Great. So now we have all of us here that we can um, address questions. Um, our next question is about the severity level in relation to ABA recommendations. This is an excellent question. So basically, will ABA be recommended regardless of level of support that's required for the autism spectrum disorder symptoms? Um, you know, things like high functioning or a mild um, level one sort of support. Um, again, this really depends on each individual child and what would be the best fit. So while what um, Kristen was talking about in terms of general structure is related to the early intensive behavior intervention, the up to 40 hours a week, that certainly doesn't encompass all of ABA. Um, there's also other legs and different directions that ABA can go in, and it really does depend on which provider you're going with. Um, there are ABA providers that do provide more support for individuals at that level one range where maybe what they're focusing on is social skill support, maybe what they're focusing on is specific daily living activities, um, such as um, cooking a meal or getting ready and more of that independent living. Um, these are questions that are really great to ask your provider who's providing the diagnosis of autism. There are other individuals on the spectrum who don't need ABA at all, actually. Um, maybe what they are better suited for are things like um, what's called cognitive behavioral therapy, focusing on things like changing maladaptive thought patterns, things that are more related to those internalizing factors rather than um, what is observable, such as the skill acquisition and reducing challenging behavior that we're talking about. Um, so thank you for that question. And the next question is, um, you know, being a parent of an autistic child worrying about defending um, against all adulthood life hazards. Um, I, again, such an excellent question. You're really bringing it on. Um, I would say that the, you know, how I would respond, and again, please jump in as, as you see fit. Um, I would say that my answer at least would be pretty similar to what I just mentioned is that, um, you know, certainly going with the recommendation of the provider that's working directly with your child in relation to um, what would be the best fit to help address some of these hazards. 
Um, so even partnering with the child's school can be really helpful here. So things like, um, you know, having visual supports in place to support what you are verbally saying, um, meaning what you say by saying instead of, you know, no running in the street, instead saying, let's stay here. I know what this person is referring to is more about adulthood and life hazards in adulthood, things like I would, um, I am thinking about things like being taken advantage of and those sorts of things. I would encourage you to have, um, you know, a good back and forth in terms of not only with the providers that I just mentioned, but also with your child to your child's level in terms of, um, what sorts of situations um, we need to be looking out for for them so to best guide you through that. Anything to add for those two questions? No. Okay, answer. Okay. Um, and there's another one here. Um, so the next question is, do kids continue ABA therapy once they are in kindergarten and school? So if you wanted to talk a little bit more about that. Yes, great question. Thank you for your question. Yes, that is uh, a possibility and it can look a number of different ways like Sarah was just saying. Um, sometimes it might be after school social skills groups or um, programs in the summer. It might even be a more intensive level of after school intervention. It really depends on the child and family's needs for more that you want to add? No. It won't be at that same level of intensity. So it's not right. 40 hours of ABA on top of being in school. So that early intervention um, at that intensity is for before a child is in school full time. I will add um, a lot of times, I guess with our model specifically, we will sometimes focus on phasing out of ABA and into preschool setting and then phasing into a school setting. Obviously that also isn't a one size fits all for every child. So some kids do phase out and just go into school. Some kids do phase out, go to school and after school ABA. Um, so it kind of does, like Kristen said, also depends. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to add to, in regards to ABA, some questions that have come up in the past um, in families that I've worked with too, is the role of the parent, which again, Kristen talked a lot about. Um, logistically speaking, I also wanted to emphasize that you are as parent by no means required to be there for all 40 hours a week of the therapy. Often, like Kristen talked about, you have, you know, parents, um, parent you know, teaching on the different components of the child's plan, but it is not a full-time job for you, the parent. It's uh, something that is, the hope is that um, they're going to access this in more of an enriched one-on-one -on -one environment with the therapist, with, you know, parent coming in as required for the training, not for all 40 hours. I just had that question today, which is why I thought about it. <laughs> um, We can kind of wait on other questions as they come up because the remainder of this time is for Q and A. Um, I guess something I'll emphasize again is just talking with your child's current providers about certain concerns that you have at this point and certainly um, ensuring that you have plans in place for anything that you may need that comes up. Um, things like significant problem behavior that's not, um, that's not calming down at all or if there are significant um, safety concerns utilizing emergency supports. Um, is a, the most important thing is to keep everyone safe. So um, certainly wanting to emphasize that. All right, more has come in. So another question is ideas for what to do for a child who's covered 
by parents private insurance, but insurance doesn't cover all of the services. Um, again, this is an excellent um, question, something that um, we have to handle a lot. Um, I don't know if you all have any specific ways that you've handled it, but I can talk a little bit about what. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. And um, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I would say first and foremost, ensuring that um, you have an understanding on what your benefits are and what your what your coverage looks like. Um, sometimes, depending on where you are and what um, what types of diagnoses are being provided to your child, there are ways of getting supplementary, like secondary Medicaid insurance, for example, to cover things that are not covered by private insurance. I am certainly not an insurance guru by any means, um, is anyone really? Um, but I would encourage you to either get in contact with your private insurance provider directly and ask them what would be required or get in touch with the social worker, either through your um, child's medical provider office or other social work support. Um, if your child does have the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, um, the University of Iowa has something called the Regional Autism Assistance Program, which I would highly encourage you parents to, um, to look up and get in contact with to determine what um, would be the best way to help financially support. Um, there are also things like waivers in the state of Iowa, which again would be quite the rabbit hole to go down, um, but would just encourage you to contact the social worker that you're able to, um, that you're able to, to reach. Any other things to add for insurance ladies? If you have a preferred provider that you're already in touch with, they may have additional resources to help you navigate that maze. All right. So other questions here. Um, child who goes through different phases where constantly wants to change the channel on the TV, any recommendations? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I guess my, my first thought would be to program periods of time where you will allow him to change the channel and then periods where it's not allowed to change the channel. So if you have specific things that you're trying to watch, that would be a time where, all right, it's, you know, it's mom or dad's time for the TV and even having a visual support to accompany that, you could try that out and see how that works, but allowing some time where um, they're, you know, where your child is able to change the channel, um, I think would be one way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we often use like a color coded card, like a red card when it's not available in a it's like red on one side, green on one side. So red when it's not available to change the channel and green what it is. And you just kind of have to over time say, it's red, it's not, we can't change the channel. It's green, we can change the channel and kind of, you'll have to teach it like for a few times and hopefully over time he will learn. When it is time, you just have to make sure it turns green sometimes so that he does get access to it and then turn it red whenever you don't want him to be changing the channel or wanting you to change the channel all the time. It's very likely that it'll take a little bit of time for that to start working. Um, you might even see it getting worse before it gets better, but that's often expected. Um, but again, just um, trying to start small and then increase from there. Um, so next question is on, and it seems like there are a few that I think I'm going to just tackle at once just has to do with diagnostic um, concerns. So um, one is on when does the level of autism typically get diagnosed? It tip, that typically happens at the time of diagnosis. Um, so sometimes insurance providers or therapy providers require a level in order to determine what that level of service is. I'm not sure if that's the case for Stride. Do you need a level? So Stride does not require a level of diagnosis. That being said, sometimes depending on insurance, it does. Um, so um, in other cases, I would just ask the diagnostic provider to specify the level in that paperwork just to be on the safe side. Um, and then the other question that I wanted to tackle just on that end is on um, 
more behavior presentation. So um, things like almost bipolar where one second the child is laughing and then the next really upset um, and then doesn't want um, to be touched. Um, so we often see mood lability or these mood swings a lot in autism spectrum disorder as well as other types of um, diagnoses certainly. Um, I would say that the most important thing is that your child has a way to communicate how he's feeling to you. And that is certainly an area where applied behavior analysis therapy tries to um, address things like having functional communication skills, being able to say what they're, you know, what they're needing in that moment. Um, and I think just providing that safe space for the child to be able to experience these emotions, um, which again, you know, it is important to be able to have a space to experience these emotions. Where we get concerned is, of course, where there's a safety issue, um, their self injurious behavior, or other types of problem behaviors that are really interfering with that child's health or the health of other people around them. So, I guess in terms of concrete recommendations, unfortunately, it's just hard to say because a lot of the times, you know. Um, of course, we're doing a lot of assessment to determine what the reason is behind it. And it's hard to give recommendations without any sort of reason, um, especially in this sort of situation. Uh, but thank you for your question. And then paperwork completed, insurance completed, waiting to get started. Um, so what we're hoping is things like this is really going to help serve the need for people who are waiting for the diagnosis. Um, we're hoping to continue this workshop series in other ways um, so that we're able to continue to meet the need while, um, while families are waiting for the diagnosis and the ABA process. Um, so I think just informing yourself on, on what's um, you know, what some of these options are um, is really, really important. All right, so now we have some more um, specific behavior concerns. Um, we're just reading through them now. Yeah, thank you so much for your questions. Um, like Sarah said, it's a little bit challenging to comment specifically on recommendations without having more background on the child and situations. Um, when there's um, there's a question about um, a, aggressive behavior, biting, pinching, scratching, um, that seems to come up for no apparent reason. One of the things that we find in challenging behavior is that actually collecting some data on it can be really helpful because sometimes there are um, patterns or you know reasons that we're able to um, track when we look at the context of the situation. Um, so not knowing your situation, I would definitely recommend um, speaking with your child's pediatrician or other supports um, to kind of, you know, add more context to what might be helpful for next steps. Um, but, it, and again, depending on the severity, I think a lot of what Rihanna talked about in terms of finding ways to redirect and kind of set the boundaries of that's not okay, let's do this without even saying that sometimes. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of either moving yourself away or moving other people and kids away from that happening. I hope that was helpful. I wish I had more context to provide a more specific answer. There's another question about um, preventing an autistic child from running away when playing outside. Um, thank you for this question. This is a really great one and something that um, safety skills are incorporated within our adaptive programs all the time. And so the biggest part is setting up those boundaries and rules and establishing repetitive practice so that the child knows those rules. So it might even be like making extra trips outside when the plan isn't even to stay outside so that we can just practice um, walking the perimeter of the yard or having other um, either you know, barriers or signals for what's expected um, as far as that safe parameter. 
anything to add? No, those are, yep. I would just say prevention is your best um, friend in, in this regard. So exactly like Kristen said, um, if you're able to have a perimeter in some way that your child is able to stay in, um, a very related question was about running off in public. So I would say in public, um, making sure that you're holding hands with your child at the very least. And if they're continuing to have an issue or like really trying to slip away, um, use of some sort of um, way to keep your child nearby. So having a backpack with um, some sort of lanyard attached. Um, I've seen those a lot with a lot of different kids, which really seem to be helpful, especially in public, because it's a safety concern. And, um, you know, regardless of, um, you know, just feelings about how it may appear or things like that, I think that the most important is, of course, um, staying safe. So um, ways of keeping that prevention in place is, is very important. One thing I recommend, not a lot of people have seen these, but it, to kind yeah. of go off that, yeah. there's ones and they're like wrist harnesses um, and they go on their wrist and your wrist and they're Perfect. really great. And I see people all over the time, all over the place using them um, with all different kids and they're on Amazon. And if you search wrist harness, they're very helpful for like public places. Um, specifically here at the Iowa State Fair, I see them all the time whenever I'm at the fair. Absolutely. Like once a year, I guess, but <laughs> um, they are really helpful and they're not as like, I feel like they're, all my parents have really found them helpful. Great. We'll continue to wait here and keep them coming. These are really great questions. Yes, while we're waiting, I wanted to ask what your favorite thing is about the services that you provide at Stride. If you wanted to just talk a little bit more about kind of what, what those services um, mean to you. Um, I would say my favorite part is that we focus so much on like their next steps. Like not so much just they're in services and this is kind of like what we're doing. Um, and that it's, we have this kind of like goal oriented treatment of we're wanting to get them into school with the least support possible. So whatever that may look like for that child. So it's always an open conversation with parents. Like what's the next step? What's that next goal? Where are we going from here? And what's most functional for them? Absolutely. And I think that that's like my, one of my favorite parts about working at Stride is that it's very goal oriented and not just we're going to work with this kid and then we don't really have an end date or we don't really have an end goal. It's kind of just ongoing. That's mm -hmm. probably my favorite part yeah. for working our services specifically at Stride. I love mm -hmm. That's a great answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would say my favorite thing about the center-based treatment that we provide at Stride is that it is center-based treatment and we try to engage parents in a meaningful way to still be involved and active in their child's outcomes. Um, and so kids benefit from a preschool type setting where I love the experience of parents dropping kids off and saying, they're not going to whatever it is. They're, they're not going to eat the lunch that I packed because they don't like to eat anywhere but at home. And then sure enough, once they're sitting at the little lunch table with their friends, they eat their whole lunch. <laughs> and just those experiences of the positive effects of seeing those behaviors modeled by other kids can just have an amazing influence that's hard to replicate other places. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing those. And it looks like checking. yeah, so it looks like we're kind of wrapping up in terms of our Q and A. Um, 
And again, we did record this, so um, we will make it available. Um, thank you all so much for joining us this evening, um, giving us your time, and we do hope that it's been helpful. Um, and yeah, again, just thank you for your time and your support. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Um,